Andrew Stell? Here. Morgan White. Jess Freiwold Day Maydean. Here. Scott Tess. Here. Marty Maddie Garbaz. Here. Amanda Flores. We're all we're here. provided the minutes to previous meetings from both December and, and February. I'm going to take a quick pause here as folks are rolling in and I'll give Morgan a chance to, to join us. That's okay. Um, in your packets, you have the December minutes. Um, is there a motion to approve the minutes from the meeting that occurred on December 4th of 2018? I move to approve. Thank you, Todd. Is there a second? Second. Excellent. Are there any um, changes or corrections for the minutes that, that you've noted? Okay. All in favor of approving the minutes for December, say aye. 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 Thank you. That passes. Um, we'll do the February minutes next. Um, is there a motion to approve the February minutes from our meeting on February 5th, 2019? I move to approve. Thank you, Todd. I second. Thank you, Andy. All in favor of approving the minutes from February, say aye. 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 Thank you. That passes as well. It looks like we have a fairly simple agenda this evening. Um, are there any uh, changes or additions to the agenda that, that you might have? OK, not seeing any. Um, so the meeting agenda will, will stand. Uh, let's move into the public input portion of our meeting. I notice that we might have some folks here that are prepared to speak. Um, yes? Excellent. Okay, the way that public input will work um, is that we'll go one at a time and when you come up to the table, if you just let us know your name, that would be great. And then if you would like to write down uh, your name and contact information on the sheet of paper that should be available at the desk. That would be, that would be great. Um, I, we would like to limit comments to three minutes. So the students have been told to do it three minutes or less, okay. and to focus on waste reduction strategies that either the city could pursue or people and businesses in the city could pursue. So that's their focus today, and I have six people lined up to do it. Okay, sounds good. Thanks for, for the heads up and for the focus. We appreciate it. Um, if you are able, uh, how are they, are they going to turn in their minutes to us at the end or to you? Yeah, everybody's going to leave their sheet of paper before they leave, which they're allowed to leave at 750. Okay, no problem. <laughs> All right, welcome and um, tell us your name and what you would like to report to us on. Uh, my name is Jacob Sanders. And um, so uh, I was looking at the Climate Action Plan and we noticed that it didn't have anything about waste. Um, and, uh, but I did see that uh, you, uh, for, since 2011, you've increased the recyclables collected by about 200% which is really impressive. 
Um, but I noticed that you don't currently recycle styrofoam, so I was thinking that that's something that the city could look into because I know it's possible, um, but I know it might not be feasible. Um, and then a thought I had was like if I know there are places that people can take it, so if there was a way that you could um, get the message out to more people, that would be good. Um, and that was that's about it. Okay, thank you so much. Um, since I don't think that got to the full three minutes, are there any questions or comments or responses from the commission? Um, any any uh, thoughts or research on on uh, local outlets? I know there's the I, I know it's been mentioned in the past here the solo cup or I guess it's the dark cup factory now. Uh, they will take those things if they're if they're shipped there. Do you have any uh, Do you have any any thoughts on on how how that might work locally here? Um, if there was like a place for people to drop stuff off, that would probably be good. Um, I don't know, maybe like a grocery store or somewhere where people are like are go to often because they probably won't go too far out of their way to to do that. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much. Hello, good evening. My name is Hassan Saglam. I'm a master's student majoring in construction management at UIUC. I would like to make a recommendation on electric vehicle use in the city of Urbana. First of all, as a general information, for a typical electric vehicle, the CO2 equivalent emission is around 4,800 pounds, whereas it's 11,400 pounds for an average gasoline powered car. Therefore, increasing the number of e electric vehicles would significantly decrease CO2 emission. And today, a lot of people still avoiding buying an electric vehicle. Providing free parking for only electric vehicles around the city and the fast charging stations at stamping grounds, such as grocery stores and shopping malls, might incentivize people to buy and use electric vehicles. As far as I know, there's only two charging stations in the city of Urbana and they're both provided by the university and since they're located in campus town most of developers and most of the developers in Urbana don't have easy access to the charging stations so maybe the city of Urbana might provide more charging stations and free parking spots to incentivize electric vehicle usage thank you thank you Any comments or responses? Um, electrifying transportation is something I'm very interested in. We had a, a study commissioned with the Regional Planning Commission looking at kind of the efficacy or the, the value add of, of uh, charging publicly accessible charging stations. And what we thought was for most people who live in the city and, and then commute within the city or, or at least the metropolitan region, they can probably drive to work and home again on a single charge and they probably park in a in their own garage but where we thought there might be some value add if there was funding would be um, parking garages or parking lots for regional employers where um, their employees are commuting um, f from outside of the the immediate metropolitan region um, and, and getting some some charging stations there would actually enable new people to to actually drive an EV, whereas otherwise they couldn't because they couldn't make the round trip on one charge. Um, so that's you know that's a that's an, an idea and an ambition. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Yan Liu. I'm a second year Master of Landscape Architecture uh, and I roughly look through the website of City of Urbana and I go through uh, the zero waste information and I really appreciate the website contains a lot of information and with all those links. Uh, and I also think educate the community about zero waste diversion is important. So I look 
uh, I look up on the internet, I found that the city of Phoenix has proposed several ways to interact with a neighborhood, and I think it's worth learning from. Uh, for the neighborhood group, the team participates in uh, virus community events all over the city to inform residents about the city and their ways to go. For the school students, the team gave fun and informative presentations so that emphasize the importance of zero waste and the contribute everyone uh, would do to the project. And they also offer like um, facility tours and business training to the public. I think through this constant pedagogy, both residents and non-residents would have a clear consciousness of what is zero waste and how their own action would affect the whole picture. Uh, and based on my own experience uh, living in Urbana, residents in my apartment do not uh, often classify, classify their garbage, uh, collecting them in different bags when threw away. Um, there only has a giant garbage cart gathering all kinds of waste. So I check up on the website. The zero waste cart is really appealing to me, but I haven't seen one myself. So I think it is also essential to uh, add up the number of uh, this zero waste cart. I think the college students in the community would would love to enjoy this program. The, we only just need um, chances to be uh, a p participants. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, at the beginning, you started, you were talking about a case study, and it was from a certain place, but I didn't catch where it was from. Would you mind just letting me uh, know again? Phoenix. Phoenix, Phoenix Arizona. Phoenix. Okay, great. In your, um in your notes, do you include a reference to, to uh, you know, further information about it? It sounds interesting. Um, and do they have, and do they have data on, you know, what's uh, on the impact of their program and any waste trends? Uh, like they have a official website of all the zero waste programs, and okay. they got schedules on their website. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you so much. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Li Xu Jing, and I'm, I'm here to comment on the zero waste topic for the future purpose of the uh, Urbana Climate Ch Action Plan. To regard the zero waste goal, I would suggest the urban city, the first is reduce and then recycle. I have looked through the city website for the existing proposed actions. Most of these actions only mention recycling and taxes to control the recycled materials. The city might need to have the waste reduction actions in the first place. The plastic limitation could be the one. Uh, other than the tax rate for the uh, production complaint, one example would be in the San Francisco, California. The government publishes the, 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 the polystyrene form and the food service and packaging waste reduction ordinance and the checkout bag ordinance to prohibit all the single-use plastic. A reusable checkout bag and the environmental friendly straw was being forced to use in stores. This approach and also the educational approach helped the city to, di to divert about 80% of their waste from the landfill, compared with only 10% for Chicago. What it did. For the recycling part, the city website have shown the wide range of, of the concern of the different type of recycling materials. However, even with the, the crop side hauler, there are too much complicated and confused locations to know where they could recycle the items. Not to mention the locations for the different material is separated throughout the city. Uh, I would suggest that the city might use a different color code bins to sort these items for as the first place. For example, in the most city of Europe, the household trash bin, including the black black one, the general waste, the blue blue bin, glass and plastic bottle, and the blue box, the only contain the cardboard and papers. The, the washing bin service and the, and the special collection could be applied by calling the city council. The donation and the batteries collection point were organized into the station as a community scale. So the easier way for recycling will help helping the, to encourage the locals to get involved into the zero waste actions. So, thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? I actually have a question. I don't know the latest on the bag law the can you 
update me. I'm trying to remember if I put a note in the sure. in the packet or in the staff report. I don't think that I, I don't did. believe so. Okay, I think the update came uh, after that was published. So um, there is a, a plastic bag um, uh, fee reintroduced that bill that has been introduced into the general assembly. It's um, pretty similar to the one that was introduced uh, at the end of last year. Um, I haven't had a chance to go through this one line by line, um, but it's generally the same. There's a fee. The state gets some of the revenue. The retailer gets some of the revenue. And then a special state fund would remit some of the revenue to uh, the solid waste um, authority for the, each county uh, for their solid waste management plan or, or some such um, scenario like that. Uh, is the general framework. So the, the latest that I know of is that it's been introduced. And, and just to clarify, introduced means that we're trying to make it a law in this state to have a fee for single-use bags. So I just, to. sorry, I want to clarify that when you say we, like it's not we, we, the we haven't, the, the people of the, people of, of, the, yeah. world, the <laughs> people of the world uniting to people make this happen. State. Anybody who sends a comment in support of it will support it happening. This is uh, Senate Bill 1240, uh, if you want to look at it on, the, on the, the Illinois General Assembly website. And um, so basically, as Scott said, one thing that, uh, one thing that uh, you know, there's some, there's some push and pull about this one is that it, it does some really good things and it creates funding streams and uh, creates a tax. Um, but also, uh, if it's if it proceeds as written, it creates a prohibition on local governments from enacting any kind of bans or other regulation on uh, on single-use uh, packaging. This particular one is set to expire on uh, January 1, 2030, and so there's still room for making comments and uh, amendments before before it. Uh, you know, before it gets voted on, but that is something that connects directly with what you're talking about, and there's, uh, it's, it's, it's open for comment, and uh, uh, you can advocate with, you know, your local, um, with your local representatives and senators. Oh, hi, my name is Xi Liu from Landscape Architecture Department. Frankly, when I checked the official website of City of Urbana, I was surprised. Because there are already a comprehensive set of policy and regulations about recycling waste. But frankly, I can't feel or find them in my daily life. In the campus, there are indeed some bins for sorting and recycling waste in the buildings. But on the street, in the neighborhood, in the city, it's hard for me to find sorting bins. Besides, I know that Urbana already has a group program called Ucycle, and it says that this program is offered to all residents in inclusive, inclusive uh, apartment buildings. But in fact, in my apartment, Capstone Corner, no one will place their uh, recycle recyclables at the curb, and actually almost no one knows this program. And from another point of view, if the people live in the apartment building are willing to participate in this program, it will also have a bad influence on the look of the city when the entire, entire apartments just leave their recyclables by the side of the road and wait to be collected. So I think it's necessary to set up garbagers, garbage bins that are used for sorting and recycling waste, which can not only bring tidiness to the streets, um, but also promote the idea of recycling to the residents. And what's more, I think Urbana could, do, could also do more in the recycling of food waste, agricultural waste, and garden waste. For now, just some kind of landscape waste and leaves could be recycled. But lots of other things like discard plants and crops, extra food waste, they all have nowhere to go. So Urbana can consider about strengthening the formulation and the implementation about poli of policies in these aspects to achieve the goal of zero waste. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, I think that one of the things that you just sort of highlighted that I think is sort of important to all of us um, 
is sometimes how difficult it is to reach um, apartments and mm -hmm. apartment complexes and making sure that everyone in apartments, as the turnover is so great within apartments, that everybody has the same sort of information. I know that we have one recycling coordinator here at Urbana. Um, if you are, or any students in this class, or anyone that you know is sort of passionate about recycling and recycling issues both on campus or for your communities, um, I would definitely encourage uh, getting in touch with the recycling coordinator and um, and maybe even assisting with, with the education. Um, I know that it's, it's a challenge. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Scott, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, I, I think that's accurate. I, I noted, um, some of the some of the particular streams that you you were discussing, we do uh, collect and, and and compost uh, landscape trimmings and leaves, mm -hmm. and um, we're exploring the possibility of, of food scrap, which you also mentioned, and we're going to be doing a survey of attitudes and, and opinions in the city regarding the potential for food scrap collection and composting. So um, that's certainly an ambition. All right, thank you. Hi, good evening. <laughs> my name is Carlos Jimenez. I am an exchange student from Barcelona. And my proposal was really related with the one before um, about um, the recycling and the um, policies. How in, and taxes in plastic bags of one um, single use. But I listen like um, the comments <laughs> about um, how the state law um, affects in these terms. But maybe the, um, the city hall of Urbana um, should say like um, the local shops and um, supermarkets to make their own, um, their own pl um, reusable bags and change it and sell it into their customers. More like instead of proposing um, a law or an ordinance and um, making like, um, talking with the shops to try to create this, this reusable box of their own commerces. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, before you get up, you had mentioned that you were from Barcelona. For, yeah. Um, are, I, I'm just curious. I haven't done any case studies on Barcelona. Um, what are sort of the recycling practices or bag tax or alternatives to the single-use plastics um, that are there? Okay. In, in Spain in 2007, um, some supermarkets start like um, um, making their customers pay for each bag and start selling um, their own um, reusable bags. And then the government from Spain approved like, a law doing that all the commerce should do that. And from um, 2007 in Spain has been reduced to 60% the plastic bags of one single use. Since, I'm sorry to interrupt. That was since 2007? Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. And um, do you, um, can you talk about some of the experience or the, uh, of, of that law, you know, of that law going into place, like, do you know what were some, uh, you know, some of the opinions for and against it, and what what had to happen for that to come into place, and what were some of the, I don't know, resistance points, if you if you know. Oh. Um, when the law, well, when the first supermarket start to um, making, uh, well, like charging you for plastic bag of one single use, all the people was like against that supermarket, like oh, they are um, making me pay more or, or things like that. But nowadays you have like your own reusable bag you put like inside the car, you go shopping, you use it, and all the people do like this. It's the, the fact that you buy like one plastic bag, it's um, a, a punctual um, moment that you forget your bag and you use this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. Okay, great. Um, is there anybody else that um, is here tonight that would like to provide any comment to the board? Okay. I believe with that, then we are moving into the staff report. 
Good evening, Commission. We are starting again with some updates with the Climate Action Plan. Um, we're working on Solar Urbana Champaign 4.0, our fourth year. Uh, we, we with M the Midwest Renewable Energy Association, uh, have created a local advisory committee. Um, with that committee is reviewing uh, the request for a proposal. Um, that proposal uh, will be um, going out. Actually, I think it's already out. Um, and then when the uh, open period closes for proposals, the advisory group will score those and will select a vendor. Scott? Yes. Uh, so the students are writing climate action plans, and a lot of them have said that they intend to tell their client to participate or, you know, um, will the, will it still be solar power hours? There um, will be solar power so hours. The, the first step would still be to attend or maybe host a solar power hour? Absolutely. Okay. So we'll do about 20 solar power hours, give or take a few, um, over the course of the year. And uh, <clears throat> what, what the Midwest Renewable Energy Association has, has observed is um, almost everyone who ends up signing a contract went to a solar power hour. So um, in terms of motivating folks who are interested um, but not yet committed to a solar ar array at their home or business, the solar, solar power hour really provides um, the information uh, necessary to really uh, you know, get them motivated um, to make that commitment. So, yes, as you say, the first step is for folks to attend the Solar Power Hour and, and learn about the opportunity. Moving on to uh, renewable energy purchasing, um, we expect the Illinois Power Authority to conduct incentive lotteries for solar incentives um, later this month. There will be a series of lotteries based on the different carve-outs. Um, um, we're really just anticipating, waiting for those to happen. Um, our project is dependent on winning an incentive. Um, I'm confident that on some timeline, we will win some incentive of some sort and be able to build a project. So, Moving on to water. Uh, we've published an invitation to bid for a bulk rain barrel and compost bin sale, um, the same type of event we've been doing for a number of years. Uh, the due date for that response, for those RFPs, those proposals, uh, is March 29, and we're expecting to have that sale on May 4th. Um, because we're s the city is selling the lot to the north of the city building, where we have historically held the sale, we're going to hold the sale in the parking lot at the Anita Pervez Nature Center. And we're also going to coordinate the um, uh, composting education uh, event that the that U-Cycle and the Park District started last year. We're going to coordinate that on the same Saturday morning. So, and, and that will all, that event itself will be at Anita Pervez Nature Center. So both of those things will be happening um, same time, same place. I can start first with any comments or questions from the commission. Go ahead. Um, so you mentioned the, uh, you've, you've talked other times about the, um, oh, doing like a survey on people's, you know, preferences and attitudes, thoughts towards uh, food waste composting. Um, is there a time frame for you know sending that out? And I guess with your with your you know discussion about the the composting event, it seems like uh, you know the or the the uh, the, the uh, what was it the 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 rain barrel event and the uh, food waste composter event. Those seem like great times to uh, you know really you know push the the survey to the people that are attending those things. It might be a skewed representation. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we're going to have volunteer effect anyway yeah. on our survey. Yeah, that's true. Um, so um, that's a good thought. I, you know, we had leveraged the fact that we we're paying for a mailing of the U-Cycle tax and this month. Um, you probably received it already um, as an opportunity to um, 
get out information and invite people to take the survey. So, you know, I we were contemplating having the survey open for a shorter period of time than between now and and May, um, although we can reevaluate that. It, it does mean that you know, the longer the, the, that the survey is open, the longer we have to wait before we yeah. declare what the outcome is and uh, whether there's something to do about it. But it's something to consider. Mm -hmm. I don't remember exactly the date that Courtney had in mind to close that, but okay. We'll, we'll you, could, you could keep the survey on the timeline that you're currently planned and have the event be sharing results and getting additional comments. Sure. So you don't stop the process, but you still have the added benefit. Yeah. Was there possibilities? Um, with regard to the survey, um, it occurs to me that any number of us might also be part of organizations that are part of like neighborhood organizations. And those would be an excellent way to kind of get the word out about the survey, especially if there are any um, uh, uh, neighborhood association meetings that are coming up that will draw a lot of people together to, to the meeting. Um, I think the SUNA meeting comes to mind for me. Um, I also wanted to comment on the bulk rain barrel, um, bulk rain barrel sale. Um, I was at a training this past weekend about first aid and that got me thinking about summer and, and getting bit by bugs and getting bit by mosquitoes. Would it be possible for us to think about doing a information campaign along with the rain barrel sales around mosquito control? It might be an interesting way to just sort of hand out a packet of information about um, pest management and mosquito control during that event when you get your rain barrel. I'd be happy to kind of work on that too. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, a couple of years ago, there was some folks associated with the university doing some rain barrel mosquito larvae surveying and, and a study of some sort. Um, it would be great to follow up with that, see what the results are and uh, see if there's some best practices that we can um, share information on at a table. Um, I always invite the Extension Service and they always have, have been able to participate and, and share information on, um, on gardening and, and natural lawn care and that sort of thing at this event. Um, but I think that would be a great one to target specifically and try and get some information out. I'd be happy to check in on with the U of I researchers, the mosquito stormwater people. Yeah, do you remember that? Oh, it's Brian Allen and his team, but there's there's more. That's just the one who I had worked with directly. Okay. So there's a group. Yeah, that would be great. Um, and in terms of folks sharing um, the survey, please do. Th there is a so that we have a long link in in this in the packet in the staff report. There is a, a city web page um, which probably has a shorter URL um, if you if you want to share that or just tell folks the survey is on the city website or is linked to the city website. Um, so you don't necessarily have to share the URL. Just tell them to go to the website. I haven't read it, but by chance did that go into the mayor's All About You newsletter? I'll follow up and encourage that it does. Uh, a couple of pieces of additional public engagement. Um, staff had meetings with representatives with University of Illinois student government. Um, and uh, those folks sub subsequently spoke at a city council meeting a few weeks ago. And we also met with uh, a staff person from Carl Hospital who was on their green team. And uh, these were just open-ended, wide-ranging conversations about those organizations sustainability interests and priorities and also what the city's working on and, and hopes to work on in the future and we'll see if um, some collaborations materialize from from those discussions um, we've already talked about the food scrap survey i've got that in the staff report um, please take the survey yourself and uh, as you mentioned share it with others um, you've probably received the U-Cycle bill. Its information is in there. Um, so um, let's try and get as many responses as we can. 
And uh, last item is our next meeting would be April 2nd at 7 p.m. I've booked the executive conference room upstairs as there will be voting in this room at that day and time. Okay, are there any other questions or comments about the staff report? Okay, let's go ahead and jump into the um, draft annual report presentation. I have a change of venue here. So we are still collecting and analyzing some data that we utilize for our annual uh, environmental sustainability division report. Um, however, I wanted to take the opportunity to um, show you some of the raw data that we collect and also um, show you where we're at with our, our, an our draft annual report. Um, it's maybe two thirds of the way done. Um, most of the information is there, but um, this is uh, this is just a, a wide-ranging discussion, so feel free to interrupt with questions and comments. And I'm going to start with um, this community water consumption data, and uh, just show you some of the. Not everything that we collect ends up in the reports, um, and also I just want to show you kind of what it looks like uh, behind the scenes. Um, every year, uh, we we request annual consumption data by um, sector, so to speak, uh, from the Illinois American Water Company. And um, you can see we get um, residential. We used to get single family and multifamily separate. We don't get that anymore. Residential, commercial, industrial, and public sector. And we feed that into some charts. I think one of these, maybe two of these, actually makes it into the annual report. Um, here you can see we have public sector broken out separately because we get that data, um, but we don't put that in the annual report We, because that's not typically how we report other data. We end up just reporting um, public sector as rolled into commercial. This is actually the chart here that I think we end up with in our annual report. So you see you know, this continuing general trend of um, reduction in water consumption, an absolute reduction as well as a per capita. So that's encouraging um, in, in most ways. Um, certainly uh, a per capita reduction is always encouraging. Um, you can see here this just the public sector reduction also a decline. It says public sector, so that doesn't mean just city of Urbana accounts. That's every account that, as far as Illinois American is concerned, is classified as public sector. Um, so other government agencies that operate within the city. And here is the per capita. The total co per capita is residential plus commercial plus industrial divided by the population. And then the residential per capita is just residential consumption divided by population. Any questions there? Scott, can do you know what the public sector, why that's the biggest consumer of water? Is it like fire department and fighting fires or fire hydrants or Who's any thoughts? I? In there. Yeah, it's U probably of University I think of the, Illinois. I think the U of I might be in there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know the number it. scale very well. Oh, between research and we have some locations on cooling campus. towers. <laughs> cooling towers. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Chiller plants. Yes. Yeah. That probably makes sense. Probably U of I consumption. I think it's in there. You know, we've, uh, I can't remember, maybe we've talked about that little bump before that happens, but it's just interesting that it happens in almost all of them. Anyways, it's, the trend is clear. Um, I don't know, it's, that's really encouraging. I think it's, that's good stuff. 
it'd be interesting to see, like, you know, to like, you know, uh, to know a little bit more about like what are some of the drivers, you know. Yeah. Uh, my my question is, could you look at the? Could you scroll to the table? What is the most recent residential gallons per person? I just you know the residential gallons per person per day, thirty four. So we should all try to get at least down to 34, and that would drive everything even more. People My can look at their home. You can look at your water bill at home and compare mm -hmm. it to the number of people in your home, divide by 365 days in a year, and see if you're, um, if you're in the winning team. And if not, you can join it. Yeah, I, my recollection is that is quite a bit lower than the national average. So um, we're doing quite well there. Other questions on water? Okay. Moving on. You know, one quick thing is: uh, do we do we have any way of knowing or finding out what what's going on with similar data in other communities around us? You know, uh, a few years ago, we made some efforts to collaborate with other cities, statewide and and also locally to collect a small number of the same types of data in the same mm -hmm. way and publish it or share it. And we just didn't get very far with that. Mm -hmm. um, most cities just, yeah, I'm not sure what the barrier was, um, didn't see a, a benefit in going to the trouble or collected the data in a different way. And, sure. and so they would have had to change what they do or we'd have to change what they do. we do. Um, we made an effort at that locally. I mean, I think the, the RPC, Regional Planning Commission, does publish some data. Um, I would like to see that. Yeah. But, but they I, don't have this level of granularity. You know, you would think that anyone that has the same investor-owned utility, we get yeah. the same data, you the same, same methodology. Um, so at least within, you know, the Ameren market and the Illinois American market, we, it should be the same. But yeah. I, I think it'd be really interesting to compare to places where water is considered as valuable as it is, as opposed to easy to get the way we feel. We, we, I was raised it's easy to get, right? But um, so, you know, comparing our numbers to California or at Georgia and stuff like that where they, they struggle. Sure. I didn't yet have the opportunity to fully review um, the charts and reports that were included. Um, one thing that I was sort of thinking about and introduced to recently was sort of the concept that the water that leaves the water treatment plant with the good water, potable water that's coming to our homes and businesses, um, that quantity of water may not be the same as the quantity of water that passes through our meters, that there can be line losses um, over that through, um, I guess, issues with the water pipes and water lines. Um, from a like green infrastructure standpoint, is I'm, I'm imagining the city is collecting this data, but I'm wondering if it makes it into the report about kind of the number of repaired, um, I don't know, supply lines or repaired sewer lines and what those savings are in the overall picture? In terms of supply lines and supply loss, um, we would not have access to that data because it's an investor-owned utility. Whether they file a report that you know, has that data or whether they would be willing to provide that data, I don't know the answer. Um, in terms of uh, wastewater, Yes, that would be a very, very different number, you know, the number of gallons um, uh, of wastewater that they receive and treat than the number of potable water that is distributed. Um, you know, water that people use for landscaping come, you know, is metered uh, as potable water, but will never be metered as wastewater because it goes on the ground, for instance. Um, so, uh, you know, those numbers are going to be very different. Um, I've never looked at the two side by side. You get into like millions and millions of gallons. It gets to be 
um, more than you can wrap your head around, but it, w it could be interesting to see how they relate. Certainly, um, we do have line loss in, s in, in uh, sewer, su sewer collection, and um, every year we reline a number of sewers. We repair sewers. It's all part of the stormwater utility. And in order to, um, well, one of the motivations is to stop sewage from leaking out of those pipes, but another motivation is to stop groundwater from leaking into those pipes, which then just becomes more volume that we have to treat through the wastewater treatment plant. Um, and so, we're, yeah, we're doing some number of that every year. If you're interested in that, certainly we can have uh, the engineering division provide that data. I'm, I'm sure, I don't know if they summarize it as a regular practice, but certainly they have all the, all the raw data. As I'm thinking about um, future, uh, I, I guess, you know, who we can invite to future SAC meetings or future presentations that we might have. I'd like to just get some input from the commission to see if this is an area or a topic that you would like to have further explored if we invited a, um, a, an engineer, for example, from U of I that works on um, premise plumbing or water that comes into the home um, that thinks about these issues potentially, or if you would like for us to invite someone maybe from uh, not Ameren, Illinois, Illinois American. American Water. Would that be something of interest? I think it would be great to hear from Illinois American Water. Um, I've never heard them present. I mean, that doesn't mean they don't do it. I just haven't seen they, them. They've been here before. It's been a few years, quite okay. a few years, actually. Um, mm -hmm. So it would be nice to know sort of what their efforts are since they are really providing water to over 90% of the people in this community, right? Um, and then the, the professor, the, the having a researcher speak, it's, there's, there's um, you know, Ashlyn Stillwell does some measurements where she measured water consumption at her own house and like flushed the toilet and saw how it spiked and stuff. So um, I think that'd be interesting to see the latest from that. There's, I don't know if others, but I'm sure there's more. Is that who you were thinking of? Okay. <laughs> She's great. We'll call her. All right. I think that that gives me and maybe Scott some ideas about what we can do sort of in the future with inviting some folks to talk about um, water and how it gets to us. All right. Thanks. Great. Moving on to the next data set. Um, this is City of Urbana Municipal Energy Use. Um, this chart here, I think, that may appear in the annual report. Um, and then separately, we ha have this chart that is um, total therms. And that's encouraging that total therms are going down. You know, I can't say for sure why that is, but I suspect it's from um, uh, more maintenance activity and tuning activity with respect to um, natural gas heating boilers in city facilities. Um, but going back Scott, up to, yes. Is the therms, this just the natural gas use in this case, um, or and, and whatever liquid, do you know what's going into that number? So you can trans you can translate kilowatts Gas is to the therms. only thing that's reported in therms. Nothing else is reported that way. Natural gas. So this is just the natural gas? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I just didn't know if it was a translation total oh. summary of something. Okay. No, no conversion. Just, sorry, just natural gas. Um, going back up to the chart here, you can see we do have um, a breakdown in lighting kilowatt hours and building kilowatt hours. And um, you'll see a couple of years ago, those were uh, roughly equivalent. Then in 2017 and 18, they're very different. This is the information I get from Ameren. I don't know why, but that's how that's how they report it. Um, I've raised the issue that there was this change. Um, the overall is the same, right, or more or less. So really, what it was is you know certain accounts were classified in a certain way as either a building or a, or a street light or a parking lot light, and then they were classified a different way at some point. Um, 
and that's all the information I'm provided. So we do what we can with the data we have. And then, of course, Therms is here and uh, the total kilowatt hours. Um, so you see a slight decline this year. You also see here that just this year in 2018, um, I have um, fuel type specific, I think those are gallons, um, for the liquid fuels the city uses. Um, in the past, uh, I was pr only provided you know, a gallons number and an estimate that, you know, f half of it was diesel or whatever the, whatever the percentage split was, and the other half was gasoline. Those liquid fuel volumes go into the, the um, municipal greenhouse gas inventory that we do every other year. Well, this year is different because this year the city has not had a fleet manager for some number of months and I have been the fuel manager and the fuel card manager for that period of time. Other fleet manager uh, activities were uh, covered by other staff. And as such, I had access to um, our fleet, our fuel management, our fuel vendor uh, management software online. And exploring that, I found that, um, in fact, the fuels we purchase are reported in different types and so I could get to a little bit more specific level of data. So that's why that appears there this year. Hey Scott, mm -hmm. on the uh, on the buildings and the lighting, are you given information in aggregate like this or you do you get do you get all the different accounts and looks like this. It looks like that. Okay. So We, of course, get yeah. information on every single account. Yeah. Um, but that's, I don't know, 100 accounts. And uh, we could try and reconcile that or, or use that. Yeah. Um, but that would be an enormous yeah. data management task. And uh, Amberin has been very cooperative and very supportive in, in exporting this data to me. I'm very thankful for, for their customer service in this respect is, is quite good. Um, but the customer service people are, you know, are not programming the, the queries, you know, which have resulted in, in this change in some of the accounts being classified. Right. Um, and so, it, you know, this is very useful to have it reported this way. Yep. Okay. I'm just, I was just curious, the level of granularity, uh, granularity that you have, and this is the extent of it. I mean, I know there's, you've got all the other stuff. Um, yeah, um, you know, someday you know, computer systems will be, you know, data nirvana, everything. We know everything, everything's searchable and queryable, <laughs> um, but we're not quite there yet. We're yeah. still, still developing. Yeah. So kind of from the other side, um, the metering on individual buildings, like could you, this is city of Urbana buildings, so there's only a handful, mm. right? Could you look at the energy for those individual buildings pretty straight, in a pretty simple process? Yes. Um, most of our buildings we put into Energy Star Portfolio Manager. Mm -hmm. um, and I haven't fully updated all of those buildings for 2018. Um, sometimes there's a lag when that data is posted on, on the website, on Ameren's website, and when I can get it into the program. Also, I wasn't entering it into the program when the federal government was shut down and um, US EPA's Energy Star Portfolio Manager was not accessible. Yep. It's but yes, now. yeah. Um, there's, I guess I'm just sort of wondering what, what ab abilities do we have with what we already what already exists do you have um, and I I'm asking this but the city the university does not do you have uh, like a GIS layer of where all your lights are and which kinds they are I think I feel like we, we actually do have a GIS way. layer uh, with every lighting pole, pole and point or sorry pole and fixture and so type of fixture correct uh, maybe some level of typology I think 
if there's one light on the pole versus two. I'm not sure that we have the level of detail, for instance, Cobra head model XYZ. I don't or, think we have that. Or if it's LED. Um, I don't think we have that level either, although. Yeah, that, that's what we're, we're missing. Yeah. W essentially what we have is a, a geographic location for every fixture. We are, um, you know, we've explored several different options, attempted several options to leverage funding or financing to retrofit LED streetlights. And we're in a position where we don't have staff time to save money. Um, this requires um, time from the city electricians and uh, We've been down one city electrician for the, I think, the entire time I've worked for the city. Um, and so all we have staff time for is replacing the lights, fixing the lights, making sure that street lights are on wherever they're installed for, for safety reasons. Scott, you and I have talked about this at different times in the past, but, um, you know, if you want to look at some of the data together what what you have and um you know maybe we can look at it together and see you know be happy to help you out yeah. and see if we can figure something out here yeah i, I mean if you can uh <laughs> survey the lights and type them from looking at them i don't know if that's even possible <laughs> but i think that's our biggest need and yeah. and uh that's a, an enormous amount of labor to be able to do that yep so Scott, has there been an increase in building square footage since 2014 when the table was up? No, I don't okay. think so. So that, that might explain the static, like no decrease or no increase. So mm -hmm. the, the BTUs per square foot is pretty much the same. We're not increase or not decreasing okay correct um, maybe with the exception that we do have a solar array powering one facility although we're not really counting anything there because we're selling the wrecks for the first so many years mm -hmm. um, but yeah the the consumption is basically static and it shows the same way in energy star portfolio manager do you anticipate not having the Civic Center or the what little bit the TriStar building might have been using will bring things down a, a tad? Uh, the TriStar building has been unoccupied for, for some number of years. Mm -hmm. and I've been here six and a half years, almost seven okay. years in that entire time, so I don't know how far back that goes. Um, in terms of this data we get from Ameren, the TriStar building would have been included there. It wouldn't be much consumption either. Right. We did have some storage facilities, but you know, flipping a, a light on every now and right. again is almost nothing. Yeah, I don't think it was heated. And TriStar was basically unoccupied mm -hmm. uh, again as, as long as I've been here. So probably not going to see much change there. Okay. Any other questions on this data set? I do. In terms of the analysis where you're on this page and I'm seeing the lighting kilowatt hours, building kilowatt hours, total therms, which would be your gas usage, and then kind of total kilowatt hours, I'm assuming that's adding up your buildings and your lighting. Correct. One way to um, look at the data where you can kind of equalize the kilowatts and therms is by doing a conversion to BTUs. Mm -hmm. I think it would be interesting to see some of this data in if you aggregated it by by BTUs and that might give an interesting picture of um, you know how is there sort of energy savings or energy increases um, from sort of all sources. That's essentially what Energy Star Portfolio Manager does. Is it BTUs per square foot? Is that something like that I think is one of the outputs from it um, the other thing it, it does is will weather normalize and then for some building types give it a percentile ranking compared to a national data set of similar buildings so I can um, when I finish that for 2018 I can I can bring some of that information in 
um, it may just log in and, and look at every building individually because um, the exports are not all that helpful in summarizing. It's sometimes easier just to look at the website. Okay, thanks. Okay. Next is municipal greenhouse gas inventory. This is 2018 is our, our on year to do the municipal inventory. And you can see we haven't finished the solid waste um, greenhouse gas inventory. Um, we do have um, buildings and facilities. Uh, we do have street lights and traffic lights. And we do have the, the fleet in here. Um, so you can see those outcomes. And this is the chart, but of course it's not complete. It doesn't have one of the sectors in it. So you can see buildings up and street lights down, that sort of swap of accounts. Um, fleet is statistically insignificant, probably. And then solid waste is just not reported yet here. So. I was, I was wondering, I don't know if you can speak to this or maybe we would need, I don't know, maybe you need to go look into it, but what sorts of things has hap have been able to happen with the fleet? Uh, has there been an effort to reduce idling or, or increase biodiesel, things like that so far? We haven't had any funding appropriated for, for those type of efforts. Um, we were able to buy an EV a few years ago because it was the last model year of that EV and um, we purchased it for some very, very low price. I don't remember now. Um, fis, uh, f fleet vehicles, um, when we purchase one, um, it's given a lifespan, let's say 10 years for, for a passenger vehicle. And at that point, a replacement dollar amount is established, which we shall uh, spend and be budgeted uh, for 10 years in the future. And uh, that's what we have to spend to replace that vehicle 10 years in the future. And if it doesn't cover the cost of an electric, and if the electric at this point in time, if the electric is not cost competitive on a sort of a life cycle uh, assessment, you know, purchase price plus life of the, uh, lifetime of fuel, um, then we're not able to buy an EV. Um, since we've had not had a, a fleet manager the last few months, um, I've also been purchasing fleet vehicles for the city and did look at um, an instance where we might consider an EV and um, again having access to the fuel management service um, we put very little miles on most of our vehicles especially the smaller passenger car vehicles and in that scenario it is almost impossible to financially justify the EV because there is very little fuel savings mm -hmm. for the 10 years that we own the vehicle. Um, about how many cars are there in the city fleet? I don't have that number off the top of my head. Um, but is it like a dozen or like a hundred? You know? Well, it depends on what you include. If you include, you know, every end loader and skid steer, um, or if you're just including cars and, and pickup trucks. Um, I'm hesitant to give it a number, but let's no, let's okay. say it's in the range of 75. <laughs> I, I can't, I don't remember. Well, you know, actually, it's, you know, it's probably more than that. There's a, there's quite a, a number of um, police vehicles. That, uh, I, I sit at Public Works, so I'm sort of oriented towards mm -hmm. um, the fleet and, and heavy equipment that is there. But um, there's actually a lot of police vehicles too that we um, that we service. Thanks. Okay, moving on. This is the municipal electric aggregation data set. Um, you'll see we get these uh, data batched by quarter. Uh, we receive that from our municipal electric aggregation vendor. 
and uh, we have a number of um, columns that we fill in here. One of the interesting things to show is there is savings, which is um, the difference between our municipal electric aggregation price and what uh, customers would have otherwise paid were they on Ameren for that for those months that quarter. And then there is PEA savings. Um, this our vendor is not doing. Um, I do this after the fact. That takes into account the purchased electricity adjustment, which is reset every single month um, by Ameren. This is by law, by regulation. Um, basically, it's a true up of what Ameren's actual cost to supply electricity was that month. Um, that's a tr that true up is done because the regulated um, investor owned utilities are not supposed to be suppliers, they're only distributors, and they are not allowed to make any profit on the supply portion. So they charge a supply fee based on what they think is the just the cost of, do, of, of passing through, and then they true that up. Um, so <laughs> I include that adjustment there. Um, what else do we have? Uh, we have enrollment over here, um, and the percent change. And you can see some substantial fluctuations. Um, just anecdotally, I can't say that there's a strong correlation with the relative price. Um, there may be some correlation, but it just, it, there may be a lag, you know, between there. That's a, there, there's some statistical analysis would have to be applied to really see if there's a correlation there, but it's not clear and obvious, just anecdotally. And um, this is this is not the city fee column is not actually reporting the check we receive, but it'll be pretty close because it's just a calculation of what our fee is times the rate. So it should be, you know, essentially pretty close. But the part of the municipal electric aggregation price is a small city fee, uh, just a fee on the consumption that goes to the city. I have a number of charts down here that. I think only one appears in the annual report. Um, cumulative Rex is not very interesting because it's just addition and goes up the, <laughs> essentially the same amount every year. Um, cumulative municipal, cumulative community municipal electric aggregation savings is interesting. Um, we have good quarters, we have bad quarters. This um, balances all that out and, and says, well, here, you know, at this point in time, what is, if someone was you know, if, well, we're all on it. Um, what's our savings? If if someone individual household was on it every quarter, f all through, this is what their savings pro profile would look like as well. So you see, on the whole, so this is like long term, long term performance. Are we coming out ahead? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. But, but is it the the first savings or the total? Like, is it column G or J? It's the PEA savings. Okay, I get you. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this begs the question, well, some, you know, we have the, our contracts and, and the rules and regulations allow folks to, with some restrictions, jump on and off of municipal electric aggregation. So could someone pay attention to pricing, jump off of aggregation on quarters when, or it's, Sometimes it comes out to be, I think, six months when Ameren is cheaper and then back on aggregation when aggregation is cheaper and save even more money. Yes. I don't, I can't say I've ever met a person who does that. Um, I can say that pretty much every person that I've talked to about pricing on the phone has said that they'd rather just enroll, stay enrolled, and, um, and, and, let the have the averaged out savings over time. They're not interested in, you know, having to manage retail electric supply contract on and off of it, terms, conditions, to save a few dollars a year. This is average enrollment here. 
can see we're down. And that's not surprising. Um, you may recall we secured a three-year contract um, before the last presidential election, and uh, then prices went down after the election. And um, so we're not competitive right now. This is a Can new chart. Yes. On that uh, enrollment, mm -hmm. um, so this is number of residential accounts? Correct. Do we know what is the total number of accounts? Like, you know, we have a sense of what's the proportion. I, I mean, don't it's always 90-ish something percent, right, in that range? Yeah. Or 95 or something? Well, from time to time, I have asked our vendor what our opt-out rate is, uh -huh. and it's very, very small. But that's a different denominator than the total number of accounts, uh, which goes up and down like you build a new house, you have one more account. Yeah. Um, a house is unoccupied. Um, if electricity is turned off, I think that you know that goes down one account. So those are two different numbers, and that, that latter instance, I don't have that number I'm not sure if I can get it or not mm -hmm. but um, yeah we have very small opt-out rate okay. although obviously it's it's higher now right and what is that what's the op do, you, do you display that graph like the opt-out rate um, I don't have the opt-out rate um, I have kind of a presumed um, you know what the, so I you know looking at just a flat and there's something like 17,000 okay. residences. That's not accurate, it's coarse, but that gives you a sense. Now I know our opt-out rate is not this high. So there's not all, you know, what that value is of this column S, I, I can't, it's okay. hard to say. So the, the data you get on the opt-out rate, that's like, I've not it's just had a periodic, that, that's not a, it's a not thing in that's here. reported on a quarterly basis. Correct. Like, okay. Um, that's not in the supplier report. It's just something I've asked okay. from time to time of our broker who manages the opt-in, opt-out. Um, some of these things, you know, I've mentioned, well, it's reported this way and it's reported that way. It, it may beg the question, well, in the next contract, why don't you just say, I want it reported this way and I want this piece of data reported. And the reason why is we are we are bidding and buying um, electric supply service with whatever the number is, 200 other communities under one um, big bulk procurement. And so the contracts and the terms and conditions basically have to be the same um, to have a to, to make that sort of bulk purchase work. The only variations in those contracts is um, uh, whether you're going to buy RECs along with the, the electric supply. So uh, that's a conversation we're going to have with the buying group and, and the broker. You know, can, we, can everyone have this data reported in this fashion? Um, but we're probably not going to be able to go our own way on that. So I was, I, it's kind of related to enrollment. I'm just curious how the aggregation program interacts with the solar Urbana Champaign. So if you, if you do install solar on your home and get the state incentives through the RECs, can you also be part of the municipal aggregation program? Yes, okay. you would just be buying less supply through aggregation. Okay. Um, this chart, I don't think I put in last year. I just started um, this chart in the last year or so. Um, but I think I'm going to have it in our annual report um, this year. So this overlays the annual uh, savings with the cumulative. That's this other chart over here. Um, so the annual is the green. So you see we have, a, we have negative in, in certain quarters. And then the cumulative is the blue. Yes. I 
you're doing some math there. Mm-hmm. And you could imagine the cumulative is at a million. Oh, so the well, cumulative looking, well, is, so is close the, to a million. You know, yeah. So there's there's the cumulative million, but then there's also the uh, the current annual five hundred thousand, like what people are feeling right now. So divided by ten thousand. That? That's an awful lot. Well, 500,000 divided by 10,000. Mm -hmm. So that's like 50. Oh, per I year. I'm yeah. sorry, I was saying per month. And <laughs> per, per year. Yeah. So you yeah. divide yeah. by 12. I mean, You're talking about $4 a month. Yeah, I mean, so that's, I, I don't know, I guess I, I feel like having that kind of context. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't sound like much, but then again, Saving four dollars a month was also what we were trying to do, right? That's that's the big victory, and um, it does add up. So well, yeah, and it matters to. I mean, it, it matters to people. Yeah, but yeah, it's at least it's not like hundred or thousand or you know. Yeah. <laughs> or four dollars a month to have all clean energy. Right. There's that's a, the other consideration. Is this is a hundred percent renewable energy credit electricity? Cumulatively. Yeah, and, and you know, it's a term contract. Um, when it expires, we'll rebid and uh, we'll, we'll be competitive. Um, of course, within the term of the existing contract, Ameren prices will be reset every year and prices change. They go up and down. We may be competitive again within this term. We'll see. So, Scott, so when was the last? So, three years. So, what year are we in now? Year three? That is on the city website, and that's where I always go when people ask because I don't. Because I was just trying to think of that graph. If if every time we get close to the end, the there's a reduction in the savings, and then it goes up again once we start a new one. There we are. So we, our, our broker uh, negotiated some reductions in our price, in, in the initial price we had contracted for. So you can see through 2019 of this year, we're at five cents plus change. And then, well, it's still five cents plus change, 5.7 cents. And then through June 2019 and December 2020, we're at 5.6 cents. So um, probably the th end of the third quarter of 2020, we will go to bid again somewhere, maybe the, somewhere in that range, and we'll get a new price set for another term. And you know we have options, one year, one, two, three year term, two years common, sometimes we do three. So we're not near the end yet? Nah, no, not quite. But Ameren resets their prices it's at once a year, is that right, Tom? I think it's once a year. Um, and so markets change, we'll see. Here's the annual. So really, this chart to the left here is a combination of these two, so you can see them together. It all makes more sense. And then this is an interesting one, REC purchases. Um, goes up and down quarterly based on how much electricity is used in that quarter. But you see the trend is very consistently down. And um, that's because as the state's renewable portfolio standard covers a larger proportion of our electricity demand with renewables, we buy less recs to round that up to 100. So that's the power 
of the renewable portfolio standard. I like that chart. I wanted to just, um, well, that was loud, make sure that I'm reading that particular chart correctly, that the y-axis is in dollars. I've recently been involved in some projects where being really obvious about the terms of what's being used on the x and y axis have become really important. That's a really good point. Let's see. It might be, it might be actually rex rather than dollars. That's a good point. I'll have to double check that and put that in the legend there. Kind of as I'm thinking about when you're, as the report comes together, um, depending on who the audience is to kind of read the report, kind of including definitions becomes important. I, I have a feeling there are people that, you know, I know people in my own community that might ask the question, well, what is a renewable energy credit? Mm -hmm. How? You know, what is that? How does that work? I'm a solar owner. I'm not sure that I even totally understand when we're selling our recs and getting paid for our recs. I'm not sure that I even completely understand the implication of that. So um, I hate to make reports even longer. I, I really do. But um, explaining some of this stuff could be really helpful for the public that decides to read it. Another way that I'm thinking about some of um, all of all of this on the aggregation reports is that if you're able to sort of boil it down to a dollar savings number over the last five years, okay, the city of Urbana has saved Urbana residents one million two hundred and you know three dollars over the last five years. That is a like that is a direct effect on our local economy or that would have a direct effect on our local economy. That means that we have this much more money to spend in in the local sort of environment. And I think that in sort of the kind of culture sort of that we're in that you know, people always want to see how much is it how much is it saving the re the residents, how much economic impact is there and how many jobs were created. That sort of information is you know where that draws it, that that information draws attention. I think that's a that's a great point. Um, speak plainly and, and and to the point. I like that. And you'll see there's um, there's an opportunity for that. Um, I, I haven't changed the format of, of the report, but there's you know the, the chart, which I hope is is as simple to read as possible. And then there's sidebars where we can add detail and say you know this part of the chart means this. You know, or the the upshot is we saved one and a half million dollars over the course of. So I, I think that's a good point. Yeah, it's those sound bites that if anyone in the media picked that report up, that those are the sound bites that they're going to go to for their reports. Yeah, still waiting for the media to pick up on this report. <laughs> I'll go on to the last chart here. This data set. Um, Community energy consumption by year. This is also a similar looking Ameren output to the municipal data set we're looking at. And I summarize that into the year. We've got it by sector percent reduction as well. And a number of charts here. Again, I think only one of them, maybe two, ends up in the annual report. Um, so we've got community kilowatt hour consumption, community gas consumption. And this is municipal electric consumption. Again, not city facilities, but what Ameren has marked in their data system is public sector. Uh, municipal gas consumption and that's it so does the city facilities get included in the municipal ones there or, or are you pulling them separate okay correct 
And do you so know a little why uptick. So, sorry. Yeah, the, the industrial, the green starting in 13, do you know that story? Yeah. Um, they didn't report in industrial separate from commercial until whatever the year that was, 2014. So uptick in both uh, electricity and gas. Probably this, sh this should say electric and this gas, or this should say kilowatt hours and this therms. That would be more parallel. Any questions there? OK, last one. Just a walkthrough of where we're at in the draft. Um, I just exported this. Um, I can send it to you if you want to, you know, read the text and and, um, and and look at it at that level of detail. My intention is a little bit more of a overall review of what's in here. For instance, selection of the cover photo. Um, I always try and find something that happened this year rather than just a stock image of some sort. And uh, I thought this was a really great event and uh, a nice photo as well. First page summary doesn't really change much. Um, if you have thoughts about. Do you, do you describe the photo somewhere? Sure. No, no, no. Just I, I just mean like, like, is there a caption that you can add to the document or there is. something the like that? The photo it's caption reads, Champaign-Urbana Youth Sustainability Summit. Okay. So this is, I, I believe that's um, Jim Angel, who's now retired um, from as a state climatologist, uh, talking about um, you know, the, the climate data over time. And we have, what is it there, 14, 15, um, under 18-year-olds. Uh, riveted by uh, energy and climate data on a Saturday morning. Unbelievable turnout. Um, I was really happy with that. And uh, that, that was a, about a half day event. Um, really fantastic speakers, climate experts. It was great. Just with regard to the photo, I remember that I had sent you some photos from Daniel Chenoweth. I don't remember if this is one of them. If it does happen to be one, then we should um, attribute the photo and credit her for that. I will double check that. Okay. Thanks. I think it's not, but I will double check. Okay. I'm going to see if I can make this a little bit bigger. It's a little, is it distorted on your screens as well? No. Oh, okay, it's distorted up here and on my screen here. Um, second page, I was saying that, you know, this is um, sort of the business side of, it, of things. Um, doesn't change much every year. If you have ideas for something different to do here, I'd be happy to hear them, but this is where we're at right now. Um, budget and, and progress charts. You know, when we get to 2020 and we may be doing something different in terms of, terms of strategic planning, those pie graphs may go away. So, you know, we may want to contemplate in, you know, sometime soon doing something different with this summary page. Maybe something like the municipal aggregation dollar savings like Stacy was talking about, you know, hey, here's a policy and uh, what's the impact, you know, in dollars or something. That might be something. Yeah, at present we have aggregation on the energy page, but it could be, you know, energy and mm -hmm. climate could be, well, we yeah. could have energy consumption as a standalone page and mm. climate uh, data as a completely separate page, so it's possible. I, I think what what I'm hearing from what you're saying is is the, you know, call out some key metrics that show our successes. So you could have, you know, here's this one with the dollar savings, here's this one with the water reduction, and then you could just say which page to get details on. Mm -hmm. So it's sort mm -hmm. of like in, uh, infographic kind of things. Sure. Next page is the energy and climate page. Um, these are the charts you saw before. Um, this one here is not complete. 
additional info may describe something on these charts or it may just be some additional info that's related to these topics. Um, this is updated here, so when I email you that, feel free to review that text if you like, and a new photo. Um, maybe it's just me, but I think with the, the cumulative and annual from the municipal aggregation, cumulative is a continuous concept and annual is point by point. Mm -hmm. So I would think that the annual would be the columns and the line would be the cumulative. Uh, just like sort of without thinking about it, yeah. I'm thinking the annual, I have to stop and read the um, legend the way it is here. I would, I would switch it. Hold on, say the way that you would. I would just switch it. So, so, it's, so you have the annual ones is the bar graph and the cumulative is the line over mm -hmm. time because the line looks like it's over time. But it's actually specific concrete pieces that when you, let me switch that and see what it looks like. I can send that to you as well. So cumulative isn't f from year to year to year to year? It's every year added up and okay. reported year cumulative to date. Cumulative over the year. Okay. It's year to date for the entire program year since Year one plus year two plus year three plus year four plus year five. Right. So in so year then one it, it was... Always be going up? No, no because sometimes we lose money. Yeah. Oh, okay. If you As look at shown the, by the line. If you look at the green well, line, that's so we why have, it was confusing to me. We have negative years. Okay. Yeah. Wow. All right. Yeah. Okay. What if instead of uh, cumulative and having like a bar and a line graph, it's like uh, there's an annual and then there's like a five year moving average or something, you know, something like that. I don't know. I mean, you know, the cumulative. I don't know, the more we talk about the cumulative, the, the, the less uh, intuitive, or, or I guess the, the less just like inherent relevance it has, you know? Uh, I don't know, I guess it's similar to like a, I just, I think about it as like a, you know, a moving average kind of gives us, well, what's, uh, and it tells us what our period is, like what's our, what's our averaging period. Anyway, mm -hmm. it's just. I don't know, I, I don't know because the, the, total impact of the program is the current cumulative number. And a rolling average wouldn't give you that. Although this may not be in present, yeah. present value of the dollars. Well, and there's only six years of performance. And, and I, think that, <laughs> I think the term savings is, is something that is, could be debated also. You know, it's savings compared to Ameren, which is not the only alternative. That's true. Uh, food, food for thought. <laughs> um, all right. I, so I think we should hire a statistician for the environmental department as well. <laughs> Not a bad idea. Um, I, I'm noticing that we're on page 13. I have no idea how many pages pa are in this page report. Page three, three of six, I think. That's oh, a okay. That's, that's a bar. A, I see. Yeah, I see. see. So it's three of six. Uh, three of six, I think. So we're we're almost there. Okay, that's fine. Um, this is the water page. Uh, You've seen all these before. I don't know that I've showed you this one actually, but that was the only thing in the data set really to look at. So um, I think these are all updated. Um, and we've got some information about our natural lawn care programming in 2018. Waste and recycling, this is not updated. We're still working on this. So all three of these charts are from last year. This text is updated, this photo isn't. So you can review that text when I send it to you. And nuisance abatement, the data are updated. Sidebar content is not. You can see we had an uptick in uh, nuisances. And this is the awards and grants page. This is updated. So question um, about mm -hmm. nuisances. Yes. Does that fall under the sustainability plan? Climate action plan. Plan, no, but it is in this division. It's interesting. And this is the last page, seven pages, sorry. 
So awards and grants, um, Courtney Kwong, the recycling coordinator, uh, won an award to um, cover travel expenses to the preeminent recycling uh, conference in the country, and then um, our foundation funding for the Midwest Grows Green programming is here. Um, it's embarrassing, I don't remember what it's called, but when you went to the big international climate event, was that not in this year? I think it was a previous year. Okay. Pretty sure that was a previous calendar year. What is year. it called? <laughs> the UN what Climate called? Conference. The UN Climate Conference. For short. I could only think IPCC, and I'm like, that's not the name of it. It's okay, I was thinking ICLEI. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How many pages so, are you aiming for the whole report to be? So the way I've set it up is there's a cover page. There's uh, information about the division page. And then there's topical page, energy and climate, topical page, water, topical page, waste and recycling, topical page, nuisance abatement, and then awards and grants page. So these are our one, two, three, four buckets of work that our division does we could you know break out uh, mayor's monarch pledge and natural lawn care as natural resources and have a new bucket if we want but that's that's a fairly small piece um, right now we're just sort of rolling that into energy and climate because it's resilience and adaptation related but that's the way it's structured right now um, and then you know this seventh page is basically the backside of you know, the last page. So you have three pieces of paper. Is that right? Oh, eh. I think so. I think that leaves no no blank page when you print it out. Think about it, but maybe it does. In any event, that's the way it's structured. Maybe you could fill in the last page with uh, the things we've signed on to. I think, you know, this is page one. Well, I don't know that we have that many things we sign on to every year. I mean, for this year. Yeah. yeah. Do, you have every to, do you have to limit it? I mean, if you signed on last year, you're still committed now. Current well, then you have a growing that list that's on? the same every single year, except you've added one thing at the bottom. The fill the space. Yeah, right. yeah. I was wondering who the audience is for this. I mean, it goes mm -hmm. to the council, right? So it's sort of, it's basically a departmental report of what the results of your work is. it is um, but I my my goal is to make it as succinct and legible as possible to a non-technical audience so that's why you know charts with trend lines and some description and some narrative story and that's the format I like the format I wish we had more similar reports. I just was wondering about well, what's I will the say that goal. The market of the report, report is, is one that I've taken inspiration from. For, uh, market at the Square. They have a really excellent report. Um, so that's a nice one to look at as well. There may be others too. But. Beyond um, this evening and the presentation of the draft here tonight. Um, Will you send the draft report to the commission? Mm -hmm. And um, will you let us know kind of the level of detail and edits and suggestions that you're looking for? Sure. I think the level of detail we discussed tonight, and then if you also want to read the, the text copy and make any comments or suggestion, suggestions on that, that would be fine too. Was there any other comments from you about the report that you wanted to add? That's it. Okay. Any other questions from the commission? I'll just say, wrap up by saying thank you for the amount of effort that has clearly gone into this and pulling together all of the data and creating all of the different graphs, distilling that information into what becomes the most sort of obvious piece that you want to sort of present in into a report. Um, I know. I would be tempted to be like, it should be 25 pages long, but I see the disadvantages to that. Yeah. All right, so thank you.
My computer has shut off, so if you give me just a second, I'm going to pull the agenda back up. I'm not sure if we are going into announcements. Great, are there any announcements this evening? Thank you. I have an announcement. Okay, go ahead. The University uh, Facilities and Services with Prairie Land Energy Inc. released a request for proposals for a second solar farm. Mm -hmm. I'm very excited, I'm working on it. And uh, we have identified 54 acres that would be on um, the north side of Curtis Road on University property between Dunlap or the railroad tracks, depending on what you think of as that west boundary, and then uh, First Street. And we are expecting uh, proposals by April 3rd. Uh, with the, um, we did restrict deployment in the field until after harvest, so it wouldn't start, you wouldn't see anything until um, October or later. Morgan, is that out in the county? Uh, I actually I'm fairly certain that it's unincorporated county that okay. it's not within the one of the cities okay but I, I was wanting to confirm I don't okay. have it I don't have it absolute mm -hmm. any other announcements okay um, I don't believe we have any old business to discuss this evening um, so with that is there a motion to adjourn so moved Thank you. Second. Excellent. All in favor of adjourning this meeting this evening, say aye. 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 All right. Thanks, everybody, for attending.